Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, this panel session goes to 410. We may not need all that time. I want to say a couple things up front. First, a couple of our panelists have to leave early. So if we do go to the end and several stand up and leave, they may be mad, but that's not why they're leaving. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do is I'm going to give them a chance to respond to the papers that they've heard, and uh, we'll have some discussion with them. I have some questions I may ask them as a moderator, and then we'll try to open it up to all of you and continue the discussion that way. I want to start, I'm, going to give, I'm not going to introduce each one individually. Uh, many of you will know all of them, or, or some of them. Um, their affiliations are listed in the program for you. But I just want to say something about the way we structured this uh, session. Um, Elijah had the uh, idea for the book, and he and I worked together, and we intentionally tried to pick young scholars, sort of up and coming, or at least young scholars. Uh, okay, at least. <laughs> I'm speaking for myself. I'm speaking for myself. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, that was a slight on me, not them. Um, because, partly because we wanted fresh perspectives on this issue. And we have, most of us, I think all of us, I say, in the book, have done what we titled this session, we've grown up in the Ehrman era, as it were. So I was in Bible school, in fact, I was at the Bible school that Mark Ehrman went to when his book, Miss Quoting Jesus, came out in 2005. So in some ways, my career, my academic career, has been lived um, and processed in the wake of that book and its best-selling status. So we wanted to, to uh, make the book uh, young voices, fresh voices, those of us that have sort of lived through that. Uh, and then we wanted the panel really to be mature scholars, who in many cases, established scholars. Just pull a hole in the round. Where was I going with that? Um, <coughs> who have either contributed to the field of text criticism as evangelicals, or in many cases have directly engaged urban, uh, urban arguments. So just for example, Dan, of course, has debated Bart several times. Uh, Timothy Paul Jones has written a book um, directly about this quoting Jesus. So we have lots of expertise, and uh, we're very thrilled. Uh, in full disclosure, Elijah and I invited them to come. Uh, we anticipated most of them would say no, and then they all said yes, which is great. So we're thrilled to have them here. Uh, as you can see, you know, the room is packed. We try to get a bigger room, and it's not because of the three of us. Uh, it's because of our panel. So with that uh, out of the way, let me open it up, and maybe Pete Williams will start with you here on the end and give you a chance. You can come up here, you can do it there, whichever you want to. Okay. <laughs> well, great. Well, thank you for the first time I've ever been on the old person's group. And I want to thank our, our pres presenters, and particularly I want to thank our friend Bart Ehrman for lending his name to this session. And for having so many people here. Um, great. I, I love uh, the paper. Where are you there? Um, I like your circles. I'd love to have this, the actual um, percentages next to those circles, please. Um, I think on the question uh, of Elijah about this misinformation being so severe on the part of defenders, I don't think the defenders of the text, on the whole, have more misinformation than those who attack um, the text. I think as evangelicals we can get into this uh, self-flagellation on the subject. Of course, popular writers make mistakes. That's life. They're popular writers. There's going to be, there's going to be loads and loads of that. When I think about um, Josh McDowell, and I had his books when I was 16, or Evidence of Man Burdick, really enjoy it, like it. I mean, he was the first guy who told me that there were versions. So I'm really grateful um, uh, for that. And um, people like Amy Orr Ewing and Brian Evans, they're all popular writers. Popular writers always get things wrong. There was a piece of time yesterday um, about our Greek New Testament, got things wrong, Electra of the Times today got things wrong. That's always going to be the case. Um, and, and so we should, should just, we should just <coughs> expect to live in a, a context where there's lots and lots of popular noise around there and we as scholars are going to try and, and have a, a positive and corrective role. Um, coming to the subject of the comparative argument, I want to split what's called the comparative argument into the analogical argument and the superlative argument. It seems to me that the analogical argument that Bruce used was very good. It was, you believe that Caesar's Gallic Wars is roughly well transmitted. On the basis of that belief you already have, I want to say it would be consistent for you to accept this belief with 
but uh, so much greater manuscript support um, uh, for, you know, in terms of numbers and all this sort of stuff uh, with the New Testament. Of course, he gives a narrative as well as the numbers, and of course, you need to have statistics plus narrative always. Um, so um, I, I would say that that's important. The superlative argument tends to be something, it just shortens it. It, it, it takes out, you already accept this. It simply goes, there are loads of manuscript, therefore it's true. You know, and there are loads of copies of yesterday's uh, USA Today, and it's not always true. So um, I, I think we need to uh, uh, use it more as an analogical argument, and, and then I think it, it's fine. Um, first century Mark, I've seen several first century Marks, um, but not Mark's Gospels. Um, <laughs> Now, uh, on to um, just numbers and apologetics. Uh, yeah, I, I would say let, let, let's keep using numbers, but just make sure we use a narrative alongside them. Manuscripts don't um, prove Christianity, but you need to have some manuscripts as witnesses well to God's word, and therefore they do become a battleground. So I do think that um, it's like um, a little bit removed, uh, but uh, still worth uh, discussing. But I really want to thank our panel, uh, uh, sorry, our panel, our, our uh, conspirators, and uh, yeah, that's me. I'll just say a quick thing. I think uh, his point about the comparative art is very important. Hopefully, we'll make that in our chapter on that. I think we need, um, actually, there, there are two types of comparative arguments out there when it comes to comparing the New Testament to classical. Uh, anybody else, panelists, want to come up or do you want to stay there and say anything? Yeah, let me make a few comments. I'll stay here uh, just to remark on a few things. First of all, thank you to the presenters. Um, certainly we're all looking for, seeking, wanting more accurate arguments. You know, details matter, specifics matter. and We want to make sure that we get our data as accurate as we can and explain it accurately in terms of uh, what we're really trying to prove by it and make sure the narrative goes with it, as Peter indicated. And so that's commendable, and I think we've seen a number of those things said here. Um, you know, it's hard to know what to do with this. Some of this, as we were talking about on the panel to break, a lot of this is well known within the guild, of course. I mean, nothing said here is really new or, or surprising, of course. Now, I know that y'all's target is probably more the lay-level apologist out there, or maybe the person who's reading lay-level textual criticism doesn't know a lot of these things. So in as much as we give them more background of what we're really saying, fair enough. I will say, I will say though, that we, we want to be careful with the sort of reverse criticisms we make, though, and make sure they're as charitable and as accurate as we're asking uh, them to be about the data. And just a, a couple examples of this. Um, we, one of the comparative complaints in one of the earlier papers was, look, you know, people get the exact numbers for the New Testament manuscript, manuscript but they don't get the exact numbers for Plato and Tacitus and all these other Josephus and so on. I feel like that's a little bit of a misleading critique, and here's why. When it comes to the number of the New Testament manuscripts, at least there's an immediately knowable source where you can get updated numbers of that. Although, ironically, in a later paper, it seems like there aren't uh, reliable numbers uh, for the number of manuscripts. So there's a little bit of an oddity there. It's like, let's get our numbers right, and the later paper's like, we can't get our numbers right. Um, but leaving that point aside, where, is there an obvious place to go that people, at least at a lay level apologetics, can get updated manuscript numbers on all these other classical sources, whether it's Homer or Josephus or Tacitus or what have you. Um, and if it is available, fine. I would argue it's not readily available, um, at least in the same number as uh, the New Testament manuscripts. And so I, I think the, the, the point to make there is that the lack of updating those numbers is not due to some nefarious sort of plot to build a biased apologetic into the works, but just a lack of access to the information at a readily level. Um, and, you know, I think that particular factor needs to be taken into, into account. The other thing I'll say about that is, even if your numbers aren't up to date from Bruce's 1940s version, the argument actually isn't any different. Because even if the numbers are up to date, are they actually flip-flopping the argument? Are we actually saying now that we have more manuscripts of classical works in the New Testament? It may, it may not be accurate numbers, but they're not reversed. And so I think that critique probably needs to be nuanced out as an example of that sort of thing. Thanks, Mike. Uh, um, there's this idea on this which that does try to give a updated number. One of the problems is that it's not accessible and no one seems caught on with that. Um, Sorry, which one? The, the Clay Jones article, the Bibliographical Test Update, is in the handout, which we'll not know enough of those. Um, but that is a good, uh, a good 
Right, so 2012, you mean? Right, it's, it's okay. more updated than 1943. Yeah. Yeah. Is, but anybody writing before 2012 wouldn't have had access to that. Right, uh, article, but right? The, with, with that is they acknowledging, well, in 1943, these were the numbers, and I don't see that a lot. And well, well if they're quoting F.F. F. Bruce in the footnote, it would be obvious that it's 1943. Right, right. Well, no, no, that's, that, that's part of the problem. So Bruce has been updated in a sixth edition. If you check the copyright date, it's like, it's something in the 80s, but he says in the introduction that he didn't really update anything. Yeah. And he says in the autobiography why he wouldn't update it. He didn't want yeah. to replace the thoughts of a uh, young man with the thoughts of an old man. So our point is not the fault, Bruce. I guess what we're trying to say is if you're going to try to be really precise and update the numbers for the New Testament, right, which is a fair thing to do, and we're not asking for absolute precision, but show the same care for the classical literatures that you're implicitly, in some cases, denigrating by comparing them to the New Testament, right? That's that's the problem I have. And it, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, but I don't, I don't, think, I don't think it's denigrating if yeah. it's the analogical argument. No, you're, I agree. you're saying I agree. you accept I agree. But Bruce's, yeah. Bruce's argument is not followed. He's not using it. Or most people who follow Bruce are not using the analogical argument. I would say it does flip with Homer. There's some over 2,000 yeah. issues of Homer. Oh. But if you compare that to 300 of Revelation, there are a lot more. But I do, I do take your point. It is, there is a danger of sort of overcorrecting. And I take your point, Pete, especially about you know, popular literature. So that's good. That's good. Anything else? Chuck, you want to continue? Uh, not, not particularly about, about the papers. I thought they were all uh, well done. Uh, I think there's, um, I, I mean, I would, I would caution, uh, you know, everybody involved in the book, maybe um, beware of creating straw men. And, um, or even, as, as Peter mentioned, there will, there will always be lousy apologetics. I mean, it's always going to be out there. You're not going to stop it. And I, I would beware of maybe um, taking the worst possible expression of an argument and putting that up as if as though that's everybody's argument who uses that argument, right? Um, I, you know, just to uh, give everybody their their due, you know, when when the argument, if you think an argument is sound. Can we skip over Pete? <laughs> 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 I see you in your way. I see you in your way. All right. Go ahead. Um, firstly. There is something called the Levant database of ancient books, and that is your simplest online site. It's just as accessible as the VMR for New Testament manuscripts, and it will give you a database of all the manuscripts of all ancient books, and that will give you the latest number of interest in the number of classical texts. If you search LDAB in Google or any other available search engine, you'll come to the Levant database of ancient books and you'll find it helpful. Um, uh, can I say I think uh, a bit more with the uh, youngsters um, <coughs> on, uh, on this, and I've found it is a difficulty and I can't trust the things that popular Christian apologists tell me about things in this field, and I find that a problem. I can't trust the details. I can't trust that they understand the overall framework. And I think there's two reasons for this. They don't know anything about the subject, and they are very interested in projecting everything positively for the New Testament, and I think that biases their whole presentation. I think that is a problem for them. Remember, the Lord said that we'll face uh, judgment for the careless words that we utter, and to those who teach, according to James, will be judged with greater strictness. So we need to be more careful about what we say. And I urge us to do that. Um, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Telling the truth is pretty fundamental to what we do as Christians, as scholars and apologists. If you're not telling the truth, you're not witnessing to Jesus as the truth. So um, I would urge you, if you were a popular apologist in the audience, um, <clears throat> to take uh, extra care. Um, of course, a number of things in this book won't be uh, things everybody agrees on. Some of these things are dispute, disputed, um, but I think there is a big issue. Thank you. I was just building on uh, one thing earlier that was said to uh, really seek to 
think of it this way, that what you're trying to do is hold a particular type of apologist accountable. Um, and that's a good thing, uh, to say there's an accountability in terms of what you're doing. I'm not certain that everyone you are quoting and citing as examples of bad apologetics are the type of people you're really wanting and needing to hold accountable in that. And I think it's building on the earlier comment and just make sure that it's actually representative. Um, uh, there's a couple of those that I think yeah, that's probably the worst possible example of that apologetics argument. Um, hold popular apologists accountable who are the, the people who are, uh, are, are the best example of, of, this, uh, of that type of apologetics at that point and, uh, and being certain to, to hit that um, in that. But I do think there's, there's a deep need. Uh, I've work, worked extensively with college students who are reading apologetics but also reading the, the new atheists and things like that. And, uh, and there are times when you have to, when I have to correct certain things that a popular apologist has said, which is, is a difficult thing to, to do. We need to be held accountable on that, but making sure, holding the, those accountable that are the, the exemplars of what you're actually talking about. Well, I've got 17 pages of notes. <laughs> Let me first offer a critique of what my other panelists have said about everything. <laughs> They, they, they all have a, a nice overview of, of the papers, and I am uh, too anal to even notice the forest, yeah. uh, so I'll just give a few minor comments. Uh, one, first of all, that, that uh, Elijah pointed out was, and, and I'm going to disagree with Tim on this a little bit, he used uh, Greg Gilbert, I think was the, the name, is that the, the fellow who wrote the argument, the, some pretty silly arguments, I think he talked about that. Um, Gospel yeah, yeah. And at the same time, I think you, you also mentioned Kurt Eichwald in Newsweek, who did some unbelievably stupid arguments on the other side. And I think those do need to be pointed out on both sides, but uh, I think we need to be gracious about it as well. And uh, yeah, I, so I would agree with you that we need to try to focus on the best arguments, but also bring these extremes in because they are still influential. Eichwald's stuff was really influential. That nobody's ever seen. Uh, the Bible, even one word of the Bible, kind of a thing. Um, and by the way, you guys are, you know, you, you wanted to do a book with fresh arguments, and so I guess the panelists here are giving you stale arguments. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Mature. Um, mature. Immature, yeah, that's, that's good. Um, one of the problems that apologists have is they like to cite other apologists, and they don't do their homework. And this is something that I learned from uh, Ed Kamashevsky, who I think is, is he still here, back row somewhere? He took off. Oh, he, he left, okay. Uh, when uh, he and I and Jim Sawyer co-authored Reinventing Jesus, he said, we need to cite the very best sources. He's worked in apologetics. I had never done that. So it's important to, to cite the best sources, and apologists need to do this as well. Now, one of the things that Elijah mentioned is about how uh, these apologists using the, uh, the Bruce argument about not doing their homework on uh, other uh, classical literature. This is also true of Metzger Ehrman. In Bruce Metzger's 1964 edition of his text of the New Testament, he talks about how many uh, manuscripts we have of Homer's Iliad, I think, and says it's about 750. 1968, he cites the same source written in 1950, I believe. There's about 750 manuscripts of the Iliad. 1992, the third edition, there's about 750 manuscripts of the Iliad. And in 2005, there's about 750 manuscripts of the Iliad. None of this was checked. Ehrman never updated it. Metzger did. And, and here you've got this on, here we are growing up in the Ehrman era. And Ehrman himself is partially responsible for not updating that side of the argument. Now, uh, I, one of you mentioned how difficult it is to get a hold of this literature. And it, it's extremely difficult. I have had... Uh, interns trying to do the research about getting it all updated and reinventing Jesus. We said we have uh, nearly, I think, 2,000 copies, fragments especially, of Homer's writings. Martin West has been especially helpful to give us the information on this. The problem you have is that uh, when you read standard uh, introductions to Greco-Roman literature, they won't tell you the numbers of manuscripts. What they'll tell you is these are the best manuscripts that we've used to reconstruct the text, and there's a lot of copies of this. And so trying to get a total number is, is next to impossible. You literally have to write to these people, and then they say, well, I, I don't know. 
And even West said that this manuscript over here might be the same as this one over here, cataloged in something other than LDAP, so he, was, he just wasn't sure. Now I have a question, um, switching gears here, about the statement that was used in Elijah's paper about Philemon and Jude, there's one new variant for every 150 words. And it, frankly, the way this came across to me is it sounds as sensationalist as what so many apologists are saying. I, I don't know what you're saying. What, what does that mean? There's a whole lot more variants than one every yeah, 150 it words. One distinct variant per word copy. That's the key. Does that make sense? No, it makes no sense at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one distinct variant, that is one, one variant. Doesn't matter how many manuscripts attest it, but one reading, yeah, per the number of words that are copied in the total number of manuscripts. So if you take an estimate, oh, copied in the total number of manuscripts, yeah, not of that biblical text. That's key. You, need a, you need a comparison that compares variants to what's actually being copied, and that gives you the total number of words that are being copied, not per manuscript, right? So the mo the most reasonable comparison for the number of variants is the number of words they got right. Okay, well that, yeah, that's one way. It just needs to be clarified more or else that's going to be used by apologists yeah, yeah. Yeah. and they'll go run with it, you know, and say there's only 16 variants per manuscript yeah. or something. So. <laughs> and there is an issue with that because it means that if two different scribes make the same mistake right. twice, okay. we don't count it as one mistake. Okay. Okay. So, you know, yeah. Now, let me there's, also there's, uh, respond to Elijah's comment uh, on uh, where he said, that, although I haven't asked Dan yet, it's a reasonable assumption. The details of his agreement about the Mark fragment and my non-disclosure included a Brill publication which has been delayed considerably, even though it might have looked like a sure deal at the time to the drafter of the agreement. Let me uh, respond to that. Uh, I have signed a non-disclosure agreement, and I'm not allowed to talk about that. So let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> I can neither firm nor deny that this fragment of Mark exists, but normally one doesn't sign non-disclosure agreements over figments. Figments and fragments. 7Q5, you, you, you mentioned uh, Jose O'Callaghan, Elijah, and uh, there's another identification besides First Enoch. It could be simply an ancient honeydew list, because you have ten letters you can dis uh, distinguish clearly, and right in the middle are Chi and Tia. That would be and some. And I can easily see some wife telling her husband, I want you to go to the store and get some milk and some bread and some butter. And it's an ancient honeydew list. This was, in fact, the doctoral dissertation of Conan DePonio Parson in 1975 on 7Q5, published by Technosma Press in Snowflake, Saskatchewan. <laughs> At least he's mentioned in a footnote in Bibsack, but he doesn't exist, nor does that dissertation. <laughs> nor does Snowflake Saskatchewan <laughs> Technosma Press, but it is in a footnote. <coughs> who, who, Metzger. Who's the examiner on that? <laughs> Bruce Metzger, yeah. Uh, Metzger originally agreed with O'Callaghan's identification, by the way. And then he changed after that. Okay, moving on to Greg Lanier's paper. Um, uh, one of the things I, I would mention is it, I, I liked a lot of what you had to say, Greg, and especially the, the later manuscripts can go back to earlier. You gave some really great examples. Uh, however, it seems in some respects that your part one was based on your part two. Where's, where's Greg? Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, and your part two was showing non Byzantine manuscripts in the Byzantine age that part one was trying to show how the Byzantine text was as good as, or not as good as, but an important contender for original wording. And so it seems like those two halves don't really help each other that much. Now, you were at times saying, I'm, not, I'm using this just as an illustration to show that later scribes often use an earlier text, and I think you did that. But just be careful about how you word that in the, in the chapter so it doesn't look like you're trying to say the same thing. And I did like, you know, what you were arguing about uh, what a dozen places in the Acts ECM where you've got a distinctively Byzantine reading. Uh, so those those things are helpful. Uh, I would have a criticism about using Sturz's data about the Byzantine text where he argued, uh, you mentioned this in a footnote, that Harry Sturz found 150 distinctive Byzantine papyrus alignments. And when... Uh, uh, Gordon Fee critiqued that work. He said a lot of these are not distinctively Byzantine, and a lot of them are predictable variants that two scribes completely independently of each other could have come up with. It is significant that 
the Byzantine text agrees with P66 on many occasions where the scribe is not particularly careful and almost never with P75. And so those are some of the things that, that uh, may be at least nuanced that a little bit. Bring in fees critique, I think, would be helpful. All right, Jacob Peterson's, and then uh, I'll pass this on to the rest of the board, because I have nothing else to say. I just need to use the restroom, so. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob, here's some other categories of manuscripts that I don't know whether we should count or not. Uh, you've got the Psalms Odes manuscripts that are in the Gregory Allon system for lectionaries, where you've got a Psalter plus Odes plus two New Testament lections. Where's, where's, uh, uh, what's his name, Jacob? Oh, yeah, I know you pretty well, Jacob. Um, and those were counted, my understanding is those were counted by Gregory. But Alon said, no, we're not going to count those. And same with the lit manuscripts, that is the lectionaries that are liturgical, where it might be just like a eucologion, you know, just a prayer book that's got some lections in it. And when I was uh, working at the National Library of Greece and, and doing the uh, preparatory work on these manuscripts that we were photographing, I discovered about 30 or 40 uh, lectionaries there that we did not count. I think we photographed them, but we can't count them as New Testament manuscripts because they would be a, a liturgical book with only two or three lections. So what do we do with those? Do we get rid of those 200 or so manuscripts that Gregory counted, but Allen didn't, even though they have a lectionary number? How do we deal with that? Or should we add these in or just go ahead with the inconsistency? So. I, I like to have specific numbers, but I have no idea how to do that with that inconsistency in place. So that's, that's a, another issue to wrestle with. Here's another uh, question, and that is you, you've got manuscripts that are dependent on printed text. You talked about 24, 27, I think. But we also, and, and that has now been discounted as an authentic manuscript, but we also have about a dozen manuscripts, I believe, that are based on Erasmus's Novum Instrumentum for Revelation because they have these textual variants that he created from the last leaf of Revelation where he back translated it from Latin and created at least 17 textual variants. Should we count those manuscripts? Are they really based entirely on the TR at that point, or are they just based on that last leaf from Erasmus? So there needs to be more work done on these later manuscripts since the printing press, whether we should really count them or not. That, that would be a nice uh, dissertation to do. Uh, and, and let me just mention one other category of manuscript, and then I think I have one other comment uh, for, for Jacob. Oh yeah, so the other category of manuscript is, what happens when you have the ink of a manuscript with no longer the physical material that the ink is on? We have one example of that at least at the Monastery of Stefano at Matera, where you have a majuscule text where the ink is in reverse image onto a minuscule text. And so you're getting the mirror image of what that majuscule actually said. Uh, and, and so it's backwards. If you held it up to a mirror, you'd be able to see it uh, the right way. It can't be, it's not a palimpsest because the majuscule text is on top of the minuscule text. And that's all we have. This has been cataloged. I mean, you, it's in the Gregory Allen system and I, I forgot what the number was, but. Uh, that's fascinating. The material no longer exists, just the ink. Do we count that as a manuscript? <laughs> so those are some other issues. I don't know if you want to put a footnote in that. Um, <clears throat> there's another one of those as well that I'm working on at the moment. Is there? Yeah, you sign it on this question <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> um, well, finally, the last thing to say um, uh, to Jacob is you, you talked about the 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 number of manuscripts, the data manuscripts, that, that when we have more manuscripts, it ends up being worthless for re reconstructing the text was, I think, roughly the wording. I would say, no, that's not true. Because of the high agreement of these Byzantine manuscripts with the early manuscripts, if all we had was, say, half a dozen manuscripts from the 11th century or later, and we were missing the last leaf of Revelation, I'd say we could probably reconstruct the text pretty well and end up with what's called the Textus Receptus. And I'd say that comes pretty close. So they're not worthless. It's worthless if it just completely disagrees with what we think is the original. <coughs> it becomes another vote towards that otherwise. And so I think Richard Bentley's argument that the more manuscripts, the more variants, the better chance we have of getting back to the original is, is an important point. So I don't want you to overstate the case there, Jacob. These manuscripts, they don't help us, in, as you said, in convincing somebody of the Christian faith. But more manuscripts 
are one more vote in terms of this stuff has been out there, it was accessible, Christians knew about it, and the text is reliable in that no essential doctrine is jeopardized by any of these uh, viable things. So can I respond to that point? And no, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I'd push back and say that potentially strengthens the nuanced point that I was making is that since, say, West Gotten Court, this discovery of a thousand manuscripts hasn't changed our text all that much in terms of its overall reliability. And if we're going to say that the TR was ultimately reliable in terms of the major things of the faith, then all of the manuscripts since then haven't contributed to a, yeah, it's maybe more reliable, but in terms of its general reliability, 2,000 manuscripts, or really 5,000 manuscripts since he used, what, 16, hasn't changed much. Um, so potentially strengthens the argument, depending on which way you want to take that. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm saying that you, you have this general reliability, and each of these manuscripts becomes valuable in that it is an affirmation of what we already believe to be the case. Right. Although when you get into the, the details, you've got about 5,000 differences from the modern uh, Nestle text and uh, the TR. So. Uh, maybe I should just say, a lot of us know each other, so I, if you're offended by all the jokes, <laughs> Texas Chris is a very detailed discipline. We have to have a little bit of levity. <laughs> so, okay, so, uh, um, anybody uh, want to respond to anything else? Other presenters? Oh, uh, just. Peter. Oh, okay. um, I need to say, there's another, obviously, another whole set of categories of manuscripts and witnesses in the amulets, inscriptions, and other such things. That's in the chapter in your site. Where, where is, it in the, where, is it in the book? Is it? Where can we go to learn more? I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's an article. Let me let me make one comment about the last this last point about more manuscripts. Um, in classical textual criticism, they follow the, what's called the Lachmanian principle, which is you try to relate manuscripts to each other. And part of the point of relating manuscripts to each other is so that you can actually eliminate some of them from consideration for the purpose of establishing the original text. It doesn't mean those eliminated manuscripts become completely worthless in all senses, right? It means for establishing the original text, they become redundant and therefore unnecessary. So if we find another minuscule and it looks exactly like a minuscule we already have, it logically cannot contribute anything to the original text that we don't already have. Do you think that's fair to say, or no? I, I would want to go a bit uh, further. I think every new manuscript does something, even if it's just insurance against the nuclear cataclysm. And all the other ones. And so so I, th I think that uh, you know we mustn't you know think of, uh, about them all as changing you know uh, the New Testament. That's not th their, their purpose. But each one of them is a witness. So I think I, so think, I think we 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 enjoy the fact that we have all yeah. of these witnesses. I think what we want to correct against is this idea that we're waiting for one more manuscript before we can trust the Bible, right? That we don't need to do. So a new major discovery is exciting, and it may tell us something we don't know, or it may shore up what we already did think before, but it's not like we're waiting to discover the truth of Christianity. Is that fair to say? I think we can all agree on that. Christianity hasn't become more true as we've got more money. Exactly. Right. Okay. right. Um, but is, but is, but is, someone, is someone making that argument? I mean, that's the I question think it, I think we have, is that we don't, we don't disagree with the point you're making, but it's just this mysterious person out there making arguments like that. I don't know who's making the argument they're waiting for one more manuscript to be able to believe. My, my sense is that that's behind some of the excitement about the manuscript discoveries. Hmm. And I'll say that's implicit in a lot of the arguments. So my paper doesn't have a citation of all that many people, and it's because no one making explicit arguments. It's more of they throw out a big number, and then the assumption is, therefore, Christianity is true. And so it's developed in the later arguments. It's not, they're not making that connection explicit, but it's, hey, let's talk about the manuscripts as a point of reliability. It's a huge number. Yeah. I, I, I just wonder if that's the inference you're drawing from what people are saying, uh, rather than what they're actually intending to do. I mean, there is some connection between the witnesses to the text and the truth of Christianity. Um, they may not tease out uh, all, all of that. But, but I, I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to introduce people to a subject who don't know anything about uh, manuscripts at all. The person writing may not be the world's greatest expert on manuscripts, but they're trying in good conscience to do that. And um, you know, in the short space of a popular book, they may not um, lay out all of the connections there. 
All right, we'll have to wait for the book then. So I'm going to read. Um, I want to ask a question. Oh, Pete, you have more? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you fly all the way to this. I did. You're quite right. <laughs> I had to sleep in a room with four other people. Anyway, that's um, <laughs> so. I guess the structural question I had about the book was what are the myths. Mm. Yep. So this is, I think, um, uh, the question: is, Are we documenting these myths? Are all these myths documented in popular evangelical apologetics? Is that what the myths are about? We give ourselves the caveat that not all of them are evangelical myths, but most of them are. Yeah. Okay. That okay. Yeah. There were some things that we really wanted to talk about, but no, they're not in there. So most evangelicals don't know very much about um, the ancient translations at all. Okay, so that might be their myths, but yeah. it'll be it'll be a book that informs yeah. questions so involved in apologetics. Let about me say two things about the book. Um, one is that uh, Dan mentioned the introduction. He mentioned a quote about Kurt Eichenwald's Newsweek article. We mentioned that, and we mentioned Herman in the introduction, and we clearly say. I happen to think that most ears actually are on the other side. But I'm not interested in correcting them to shore up their conclusion. You see that? The aim of the book is to correct our bad arguments in order to shore up the right conclusion of many people we think use some of these bad arguments. Okay? And let me just also say, we think there are plenty of good examples, and they're on the panel. Okay? So we're not saying that this is, you know, everyone is equally <laughs> bad. <laughs> Um, what we're saying is there's the states that get repeated over and over and over again, kind of like the states in manuscripts, right? And they get multiplied, and some of them get broadcast to large audiences, and that's what we want to try to address. Um, let me ask a question of the panel. What do you think is the connection between inerrancy and apologetics on this front? Think there's a connection? Should there be a connection? Sure. Um, I think we need to distinguish between in inerrancy. We, when, I, when I'm dealing with a skeptic in apologetics, I'm not trying to argue for inerrancy. Um, that's something that is an affirmation we make by faith that is based on the character of God and the plausibility we find in what we have. That's not the argument we're trying to make in apologetics. The argument we're trying to make in apologetics is... Uh, that, that, that the text as we have it is, is, is a reliable text and that represents a reliable story um, that, that we can, and that's what we're confronting the skeptic with in apologetics. And so I'm not, personally, I'm not particularly concerned with the connection between textual criticism and, apologeti and, and apologetics in, in, I'm sorry, in, in textual criticism and, uh, and apologetics and inerrancy uh, in that. Textual criticism and apologetics, yes, but not inerrancy, because that's not what we're trying to do. That's an internal discussion we have um, in some sense that, uh, that is, is we should affirm and we do affirm, but it's not what we're trying to do in apologetics. That's a different, something different we're trying to do there. Okay. I take a, a little different uh, approach on it, um, where I would say, depending on your view of textual criticism, your theory, we do have evangelicals who hold to inerrancy, who embrace the major schools of textual criticism. Therefore, the text that they have reconstructed as original, they believe is inerrant. And consequently, the issue of inerrancy uh, in, in textual criticism is a moot issue. Another way to put this is, as Peter uh, Williams did in his response to Ehrman, I think, on the radio some time ago, was Ehrman keeps talking about how we don't have the original text, so how can you claim it's original, uh, that it's inerrant? Well, we don't have the original manuscripts, but we do have the original words. And consequently, you can test the theory whether inerrancy is violated by this. And I wrote an article that's, I, I don't even remember, remember the name of the book, nor the name of the article, uh, but uh, it has to do with, is inerrancy something that is attacked by these textual variants. And I listed, I think, a dozen of the most uh, egregious problems for inerrancy that are related to textual criticism. And they do not even hit the radar of the big problems for inerrancy. And so uh, I, I think it's, you know, we have the original words, we have the original text that say it's above or below the line in the Nestle text for all practical purposes. That's where we have the original. 
and we can test what your inerrancy is true on that basis. So I don't, I don't think there's a problem for it at all. Pete Williams, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, um, I think um, part of what we've got to think about is that you don't need to have any copies of the Bible to believe that when God speaks, he's a truthful character, everything he says is true. That's what inerrancy is, is fundamentally um, about. I think there's also a question of, of the burden of proof. So I think that um, you know, back in the days of Erasmus, you know, John's Gospel still began in Archaean Holocaust. Um, and there was a presumption of reformers and others who read the, the scriptures that uh, this was what was first given. And the burden of proof is on anyone to show it's not what was first given. So it's not that you have to go out and verify and show that something hasn't changed. It's that simply there's no reason to think it has changed. And so you uh, accept that. Um, and that's where I think um, we can say, <coughs> text is an ambiguous word, but original wording, we have, the, uh, we have the original wording. It's reasonable to believe we have the original wording. Or it's your job to show we don't. So uh, that is, it's a, a disprovable presumption. Uh, and so it's simply, that's, that's the epistemic status of, 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 of what you have until someone shows you uh, some um, you know, great argument or, or um, you know, early manuscript to the contrary. There's no reason not to receive a, a witness that comes uh, from the past. The other thing is the question of uh, not to confuse the question of our certainty about the text with the certainty of uh, the wording or text. God is completely certain about all the words he ever spoke. And whether or not I'm certain about which of this variant or that variant uh, is uh, the one he spoke, well, that's a statement about me. It doesn't actually depend on how certain I am at all. Um, so I need to bear that in mind. Here, that God's words can be completely certain, and I might be drunk and not have a clue which one of them is. You know? so, uh, it, so that doesn't vitiate the doctrine of Scripture if, for whatever reason, well, I'm intellectually incapacitated. Presumably, you think we do have most of God's word? Well, I think uh, that uh, there's no reason to believe we don't have <coughs> all of the words he gave. Uh, it's the uh, burden proof is on someone else to demonstrate, um, you know, that, that there's good reason to believe we don't. I, I, I think, um, you know, find me a text, you know, um, you know, Bart or anyone else, where you think you can make a stronger case that we don't have the wording um, than that we do. Um, go. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead for the sake of time and open it to the floor for questions. So. Yeah, just uh, two concerns. I'm an apologist. I've been doing apologetics for 25 years. And one of the challenges that we face as apologists is that we don't, we cannot be experts in all the fields. And the nature of our business is variety. I mean, we have historical challenges, philosophical challenges, theological challenges, uh, I mean, in every branch. Uh, so what we do, or, and I speak for myself, is rely on the experts. I, I, I get your books, and I'm, I don't have the PhD in, in what you do, but I'm going to trust that you're going to be honest and you're going to give me material that I can then turn around that, and, and put it in a way that my audience is going to understand it. Uh, but this this type of workshop that you guys, these papers you guys have presented have been invaluable to me. Because every single apologist that I know in the circles that I have circulated for 25 years has been doing it wrong. Well, Our approach has been a three-pronged three approach. I mean, what's the most well-attested ancient document other than the Bible? Homer's Iliad, 645 copies. That, and that number has been forever the number. Uh, then the second is how close do we get to the originals? Fifth, within 50 years of the original. And what about accuracy? 99.5% accuracy. That is something all of us are doing. But we didn't pull this out of a hat. I mean, we'll, we'll go to, we'll, we, we go to F.F. Bruce, who we would consider to be an expert on this, and we'll go to Ch Josh McDowell, and we'll go to these guys, and we'll take the data from them, and then we'll run with it. Uh, so my, my concern is that uh, your book will be very beneficial to us if, if it doesn't turn out to be used against us. Mm -hmm. And that's the goal. That's the goal, not used against you. I mean, uh, well, technology is for you. To uh, be a resource for in, you. In a sense, I would, I would, uh, yeah. I, I, without seeing the text, I would, I would re request that uh, when apologetics are being dealt with, or apologists are being dealt with, yeah. uh, it would do no service to any of us to discredit 
like an Amy or Ewing or a Josh McDowell or any of these people because in doing so, you're discrediting. We need uh, to dis uh, part of what we need to distinguish, and I'm not sure we're always great at doing this in evangelical circles, is distinguish an argument from a person and their whole work, right? If we give an example of Craig Blomberg, I'm hardly saying that don't trust Craig Blomberg's work on the Gospels. That would be absurd. I'm saying on this one issue, he's a good example of how easy it is to take a stat and abuse it. For example, to not have the right narrative as he relates the draft. So what we want to do is say, let us walk you through why the statistic is wrong. Let's replace the stat and then replace the narrative as well so that you do have something to work with. Whether the book will give you easy uh, sound bites to replace your current sound bites with, I'm not sure we'll do that. I want to leave that up to your creativity. Does that make sense? Well, well we want is the truth. I mean, the sound right. bites, we, right. we need to take that truth and make it digestible for the exactly. common man. And, and part of what we're saying is, listen, we're not all great at being people to digest. We actually think a lot of you are better than we are at digesting. So we want to give you sort of the ammunition that you can then figure out, okay, how can I communicate this at a better level, but using the same information. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I was thinking about some of those things that uh, Juan was, was talking about, wondering if, if even the, the title of the book and the titles of every chapter, if you might consider rethinking those instead of myth, 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 uh, which, which does come across, I think, to a lot of people as, you know, maybe everybody before us yeah. has been wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Something like refining the argument, or some, you know, change, just changing the, the key a little bit. <laughs> it's marketing, but I, 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 I understand. I would say, with all of the atheists that I've engaged, none of the arguments have pivoted on how much uh, attestation there is for the New Testament. It's always been on other topics that they've argued against the existence of God, and the, the failures of the church to be the church, and uh, unanswered <coughs> prayer, or seemingly that that uh, God isn't showing up or whatever. I, I've only talked to one in all my years of trying to engage people on the subject that, I, that I've had the person flat say, well, the problem is that you don't have a, uh, a text without corruption, and that was my brother, and that took place a week ago. And, but, but that's not the problem. My brother went through some really tragic circumstances, and so now he believes there's no God, and he's latched onto what he's heard of this soundbite that says, well, you can't trust Scripture, and that's what he's, that's what he's blaming. Her. And we, but, you know, we are, look, this is about the bottom of the church. We right. all have our own gifts. So we're trying to do our part. But my, my concern is what uh, this brother brought up is that... Um, that your book could be used by those who oppose God or whatever as a mean to, means to undermine not maybe a specific apologist, but the idea of it at all. So I would just say, you know, I think I'm hearing that from others as well, just a real caution about how it comes across in the book. Peter, so, could I jump in yeah, on this real quick? Um, I, I get an email, at least one email every week from somebody who says, I have uh, completely converted to Ehrman's views that the text is corrupt, we can't get back to the original, or I have come back from that view. And I have, I estimate that there are at least tens of thousands of uh, college kids who have left the church during their college years because of Bart Ehrman's writings, in particular mm -hmm. misquoting Jesus. So this is a huge issue. I call it a pre-apologetic issue, namely, has God said? And that's the first place that they are, they are coming to. So I hear this argument all the time. Uh, so I can just verify that I have uh, debated an atheist with a very popular website and that was more than 10,000 people listening. And he did hit me with the, you've got the numbers wrong for Homer. You've got the numbers wrong. You know, he yeah. said, so it, it's out there. And look, like what Pete said, we're, we, we want to tell the truth, right? And there's important questions about how we tell it so that we don't, we're not misheard, um, but we need to tell the truth. For, for those of you who are experts uh, in whatever sort of field, uh, the internet is huge. Uh, there was a study done on atheists and atheist college uh, groups around campus. They typically 
became an atheist not on these kinds of grounds, but after they became an atheist or their, their faith was crumbling, then they gobbled up stuff on atheist websites. And you get all these kinds of things. And I think it's very important for us to be aware of what's up there. And if nobody's responding to it, when it comes up, you know, something else comes up and there's a response to it, and that's a real problem because people will, will, will read what they want to read and they'll read this atheist stuff, but if there's not something right next to it that challenges it, uh, that, that's a problem. And so I, I just think we need to be very aware of what's going up there on, the, on the atheist websites and be able to have uh, those of us who can respond and make sure that there are things up there that challenge us. Any other questions? Um, let me ask the uh, panel, as you've taught and written on this subject, how has the apologetic issue or has the apologetic issue changed in your career? Uh, I've heard from some, uh, from, for example, my, my colleague who said before Irwin's book, he, his students never cared about text criticism, and uh, now they care about it quite a lot. Is that a shared experience on the panel, or like maybe you could talk to that since uh, you've written the book? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the title of this whole session is Growing Up in the Herman Era, and, and of course, we've all, in one sense, grown up in the last 20 years in that era, um, whatever age you are. And so, you know, my, my experience is, is that every year that goes by, his writings become more popular, the more people want to talk about it. Um, you know, I think a seminary education that doesn't address tech critical issues at a fundamental level in, in, in whatever classes need to be addressed is going gonna, is gonna to miss the mark for these folks. The problem pastor's face is that it's not that they're getting asked these questions from scholars, they're getting asked these questions from the people in the pew that are, are reading, you know, Kurt Eichenwald's disastrous Newsweek article uh, or one of Herman's books, and they're thinking, well, well, I need answers, and they go to their pastor, and the pastor has have no idea uh, what to say. And so, yeah, we, we've tried to make it uh, something that is a foundational piece of our prep for those in ministry, and I think that's becoming more and more urgent as the years go on. I'm sure my colleagues would say in their seminary situations or university situations they're probably seeing something very similar. Yeah, I, I would say I serve both as a pastor and as a professor and um, there's a distinction between so the, the students, the college level students, they may be consuming this at the level of misquoting Jesus or, um, or some books like that. The people in the pew are, are uh, absorbing a, a dumbed-down version of it in, such as the Newsweek article and in sound bites that they're seeing and everything like that. So part of what we have to do is be able to deal with this um, on both of those levels at the same time, um, on that very basic level. The problem is, I think, with textual criticism, you should be honest about, it is, it is sufficiently complex that giving a sound bite answer is almost always the wrong answer. Uh, and that's just hard at that point. And, uh, and I think we have to, we can be honest with ourselves and with others and be able to say this is, and, and give an idea of something, but at the same time uh, to say, now there's much more to this, to, to add caveats to that so that we can make sure we're being honest to what we're doing, but at the same time actually engaging the questions. Just simply be aware of that. But uh, yeah, I had a great group of the course I just taught on how on the history of the Bible and those students were far more interested um, than I think it would have been in the past uh, in textual criticism and in uh, digging into this I had them actually read misquoting Jesus um, and and actually learn to engage with those arguments uh, in that and it was a really good experience for them uh, in doing that as well uh, just if a quick survey if I may are there people in this room who would say that they were drawn into textual criticism because of the writings of Bart Ehrman and their engagement with it. Anyone who's, you know, we got one, you know, two, uh, anyone three? I mean, so, I mean that's, that's not bad actually, I see that. Be because I think that you'll find that around the place. There are lots and lots of evangelicals taking textual criticism more seriously because of our friend Bart Ehrman, who's actually drawn people into this. So the great result of all of this is going to be far more um, uh, Bible positive textual criticism because we've worked. So, uh, Amen. One more irony. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just attest my own take. I didn't get into text criticism because of it, but my interest was increased significantly. Yeah, I see. Because of it. So, yeah. Oh, we have a but, former student right here. Let me add to that, that was the exact question I was going to ask. Uh, I think everyone in this room probably has some critiques of Airmen, and obviously the panel does. What would you say have been some of the positives of his work? Obviously, you should definitely touch on some. Uh, do you see any others? Are we willing to admit those out loud? Um, should we only do those in secret? I mean, <laughs> what have been some positive consequences of his work? 
Let, let me uh, address that, which was part of what I wanted to say anyway, and that is one of the things that Ehrman has done in his television interviews, his radio interviews, newspaper, magazine interviews, is he starts out being very sensationalistic. And uh, I have seen audiences gasp when he says, well, the story of the woman caught in adultery might not actually be part of the Gospel of John. And, and yet, in their own Bibles, in the margin, it says the earliest manuscripts don't have this. So it, it's, it's as if, well, they're just not reading this. Uh, I think what Ehrman has done positively is he has let the cat out of the bag of the issues that, that scholars know about and that lay people should know about because of what their Bibles are doing, but they don't know about them. And consequently, what one of the tasks I think we have is to address those very passages that have some doubt to them about their authenticity. And, and they, uh, people need to hear this, Christians need to hear this from us, not from the enemies of the gospel. And so in the debates I've had with Bart, I start off by saying, he and I agree that these passages are probably not authentic, which takes all the teeth out of his argument. He doesn't have any kind of a, a shock and awe kind of a, a thing after that. And then uh, I conclude by quoting him and misquoting Jesus, page 252 of the paperback, where he says, no essential doctrine of the Christian faith is jeopardized by any variance. And I said, well, we could have started with this, but then the debate would be a lot shorter. <laughs> So he has done some positive things for us to yeah. talk about these very issues, but we need to be talking about it well, too. I think it raises the question, Andy, you know, you mentioned, I always tell my students, or, or people I talk to about it, most of the most interesting variants are in your English Bible. There's a footnote saying, you know, maybe the show manager say, is there something we need to be doing better on this front? And what is it? Reading the Bible. What's that, uh, reading the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> reading the footnotes. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what else to do. I'll, 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 I'll mention this. I, I wonder what most pastors do when they get to the long ending of Mark or the you know, the Bill Woman. Um, whether that would be an opportunity within, and I'm not saying you know sermons should turn into lectures, but I'm saying there's an opportunity to educate your churches at those junctures in appropriate ways and where the Bible came from. My experience is in the evangelical world, most people in the pew believe the Bible, but in the evangelical world, most people in the pew also have no earthly idea where the Bible came from or how it got here. Um, and there's only, in their life, the only person that's going to be around to do that is the person who's been charged with their, their spiritual health, and that is the pastor. And so I go back again to the seminary level education on this topic, and the pastors at some level, not at a crazy technical level, at some level need to probably address it from, from pulpits. I think in our attempt to make user-friendly sermons, at times we don't deal with it. When we, when I'm preaching, I want to. When there's a text that is questionable, what I want to point out is, and it takes it takes a minute out of the sermon to say, you know, what some manuscripts say this and some say this. But I want you to notice that really the whole point of this passage wasn't changed by the difference. Boom, and you move on. And what you just expressed to them is faith in the text they have, but also an honest awareness that there are manuscripts that are different in that. And, and that's what, if, if you do that on a regular basis, when you get those texts, in your regular cycles of preaching, what will happen over time is when they hear something sensationalist from somebody like Bart Ehrman, they just aren't as shocked by it uh, at that point. And that's what we're trying to do. We want to make sure that when they hear it from the skeptic, it's the second time they heard it. And because what I get from college students over and over that get a hold of me on this is I got to college and I never heard this before. I never heard it before. Amen. Well, I want to say, uh, uh, not being an evangelical theologian, but even something of a liberal theologian, nothing that Bart Allen ever said in this book is new. Right. Everything is hundred years old. In Germany, we had discussions about this it's over hundred years. Now, we, then Bart Elmer came up with his, with his. Uh, he makes everything very sensational. Mm -hmm. What is, what is trivial. Mm -hmm. Many things will be. Certainly, there are barriers. Mm -hmm. Many barriers. But the barriers that, that don't change. The, the, the meaning mm -hmm. of, of, of the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, many things, and, and even if I also uh, worked as a pastor for some, some years, uh, I had no problem in, in preaching to say, uh, this letter, I think, or the, the, most of the scholars think, the letter of Paul isn't from Paul, but from his, from his school. So, but the, the letter is right. The text that I preached to them, I think the most important thing is that we have to be honest to our audience. Uh, and uh, and I would not ever say this can be used by some 
bad people. But everything can be, every truth can be used uh, for some bad purpose. So I think uh, uh, we have to, as, as a as scientific, scientific person, we have to find out the truth. And then we can, then we can uh, act as apologetic and say, now, what do we do uh, with this, with this <coughs> historical truth of, or more, more truth to say, with, our, with this historical hypothesis that we have? Because one thing I always think, uh, Emma and all the others, they say scientific uh, uh, theology is something that is uh, totally true. No. If we, are, if we are working scientifically, we only have hypotheses about the truth. The word of God, uh, as, as, a, as a Lutheran theologian, I think the word of God is not identical with the with the with the, uh, 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 the scripture word by word. Uh, the, the word of God is is really uh, in the scripture. But for example, I, as, a, as a Lutheran theologian, uh, I, I believe in the uh, credo, credo, what do you call it? The, the apostolic creed, the for example. Oh, okay. And there we are. I believe in the Father. I believe in the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. But nowhere I say I believe in the, believe in the Holy Scripture. I believe in the Word of God. But to say, mm. but to believe in the Word of God that the Scripture doesn't, doesn't mean that the, that the Scripture is inerrant in that case, that every word, every sentence really uh, 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 is, uh, is word by word the Word of God. Uh, for me, inerrancy as a Lutheran theology would mean in, uh, in what concerns the, 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 the truth of the Gospel, what concerns my my, my belief, what I have to believe, and what I have to do in life. Their scripture is inerrant. Because scripture is the only way to find out what, what, what God wants, wants from me. But I think we should distinguish between, between the, the, uh, the gospel, the word of God, the evangelium, and, and this uh, text critical problems we have. Text criticism is very important. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> but it never changed my belief. And I think this is very, very, very important. If you take the, the oldest manuscripts on the one side and the, and, the, and the youngest manuscripts, you will not find another gospel. Mm -hmm. But Ammon right. tries to say is, you will find another gospel. He talks about many Christianities and all these things. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Uh, for this, that's, that's not true from a mere historical point of view. And it has nothing to do with my belief. Mm -hmm. I can say many of the theses of, of, of Ammon are definitely wrong. Not because I have been, and not because he's an atheist, not because he doesn't, doesn't believe anymore, but because his arguments are not sound. Mm -hmm. And so I think the most important thing is uh, for for making apologetics is to be true and honest to the to, to, to ourselves and to our audience. Because the, uh, if, if we are not honest, then we it all will fall back on us. Oh, that's what I'm Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anybody want to? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, what Holger was saying was very important. We we are we are confident that the uh, that the text itself, the original text that God gave, is inerrant, and even some of us, most of us, probably that 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 original wording is available somewhere. It's 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 some it's there to be discovered, but we don't have to have the actual every word. We don't have to have every word that, that Paul wrote or that Luke wrote uh, in order that to, to say that we have the word of God. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and that's, and, and ultimately, uh, you know, we, we don't want to lose the forest for the trees in, in all of our discussion of, of the manuscripts and the variants and so forth. And as has been said before, that's, that will not bring someone to, to God. It, it, God himself, the gospel, and the Word of God, Scripture, are all self-authenticating. I mean, they, they prove themselves, and and uh, that's what brings to, to faith. Uh, so. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, in terms of resources for the church, Dan Wallace's 18-hour class on text criticism just went up on biblicaltraining.org, and they also have a three-hour summary that he did for them. However, you need to read the book to fix all the mistakes and myths that I have in that. It's always work to be done. I have a question on Ehrman. Uh, I've heard several apologists use the tactic of pitting Ehrman, the scholar, against Ehrman, the sensational popular writer. Is that an accurate 
argument. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on urban, but I've heard several of you that Bill Sorge, Bill Sorge's academic work, which seemed to contradict some of his statements in the popular work. Yeah. When when Ehrman did a, uh, a critique of the James of the uh, ECM, he said, well, there's very little difference from the Nestle text, one, maybe two variants. And he said, uh, it seems like what we're at now in textual criticism is a mopping up job. Mm -hmm. In other words, we've, we've arrived at the original, let's move on to something else. And then he writes his popular work where he says, we have no idea what the original text is. But I think his sensationalism has now become his conviction. I think he is moving towards that. Every time he writes another book, it moves more in that direction. When we first debated in 2008, he felt that intrinsic evidence was important. That is, what did the author say? Now, he says, I have no idea what the author says. So he has to throw that complete category of textual criticism out. And he's moved from agnosticism now to atheism. So he keeps moving further and further to the left. So I'd say there isn't much of a difference now between the two elements there was before. Can he, when he's pushed on that, can he show a progression of evidence that has caused him to move in that direction, or or not? I mean, can he show can he show the dots of how he has now disagreed with his earlier self? I I've asked him about that, and one of the things that he has said is uh, in our debates, I am not allowed to use his earlier works against him. <laughs> and, yeah, and so at one point I, I, in our one of our debates, I showed all these books that he had written where he assumes he knows what the Bible originally said in 99% of the places. And then he writes Misquoting Jesus where he assumes we can't know what it originally said. And he did a blog about that where he said, you know, Wallace is citing books that I wrote 30 years ago, and so how could he possibly use that against me? I've changed my views. Well, one book was written 30 years ago, one was written three months before that, and he was still saying the same thing. Right. So he was being very selective with the, in how he responded to that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I want to ask, uh, does anybody have an overview about the uh, Islamic world? Is there something similar going on, like an Islamic part of Yemen? And what is the um, status of the Quran? I have no idea. Anybody else? There are some who are working on the Quran, textual criticism. I forgot his name, the fellow who did it at London School of Theology, a comparison of New Testament textual criticism with uh, the Quran. Uh, anybody know his name on that? No, I've seen now Dan Brubaker doing some work on that. So yeah, that's not good. Things it's Keith Small. Keith Small is one. Yeah, Keith yeah. Small. He's done some really good, good work. and. There is now more work being done on the Quran palimpsest manuscripts that are pre-Uthman that seem to contradict what Uthman had to say. But in Small's dissertation, what he essentially argued is that both of them are reliable texts and that uh, even though the Quran can't get past Uthman, with the New Testament we have manuscripts that differ significantly more than with the Quran. Both, we can get pretty much back to the original text. And so now the question becomes, okay, what do they say? Not, uh, or what do they teach, rather than how do we know what they say? And so I, I, he's done some good work, and, and there are some others as well that are doing that. I'd like to ask the panel, if we're to be honest with our audiences, <coughs> say, you know, let them know about these problems in the text. <coughs> Just imagine my church saying, somebody will stand up and say, Jesus said that not a jot or a tittle will disappear from God's word. How would you handle that? There is an assumption that the Bible teaches the doctrine of its own preservation. And it's based on about five verses, that being one of them. Uh, some people actually like to quote from uh, the Olivet Discourse where uh, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away, as though that's talking about the same thing. Well, if that's the case, then Jesus must have spoken for only two hours. Because if you take, I mean, if you take all the red letters in the Gospels and you read them at a reverential pace, assuming they're all different settings, that's two hours of reading. So he never said another word, because none of his words were all will pass away. Those passages are either talking about the promises of God 
or the commands of God. The word of God cannot be broken, this kind of thing. Not one jot or tittle uh, is going to pass through the law until it's all fulfilled. It's not talking about the written scripture being available to us today. So I don't have a doctrine of preservation that says we have the original. I, I argue for that on the basis of historical evidence, not on a theological basis. Yeah, I mean, there's a tendency sometimes that we have as evangelicals to see the word word in the Bible and assume that means written scripture, right? Quite often. Yeah. Um, good. Any other questions? I want to maybe try to end early because I know this is the last session I want to be late. Let me just say for those of you who are scholars and everybody, uh, I was looking at a catalog for the great courses. You know, people want to be able to get the best scholars in the U.S. or around the world to be able to actually have a video of this course. And they had about three things early in the New Testament, and two of them were Bart Ehrman. Okay? I think someone can write to them and say, actually, Bart Ehrman doesn't represent where scholarship is on these, on these things. And here's a, here's, a, here's a person you might consider who is a very eloquent uh, uh, instructor, major university, uh, to encourage them to include something to give a little bit of balance. Because if people will read that, and they think these are, the, these are the top scholars in their fields, and then they get harder. Right to him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to give the last word to Pete Head. That's all right. Is he awake? <laughs> Pete, do you have any final words that you would like to leave us with? Oh, you came very far. Is that all that isn't like the words? <laughs> <laughs> Always be ready if anybody asks you to give an account of the hope that is in you. Amen. <laughs>